Frankfurt is my home uh, for that. I love it. Uh, everybody loves their home with all the flaws that it has and with everything that it entails. The overall mentality is different than in mainstream society, obviously. And it starts with small things. Like, one example is, I also have to say that I was always, growing up, I was always, like, caught in between two worlds. Yeah, I don't know what you look into for people, by what standards you, you judge them. Things like loyalty, honor, respect. Honor is like a concept that is completely abandoned in modern society. You get left at for that if you say, I have my honor, fool, or whatever, yeah. you know, why you take your honor. And honor is still a positive concept. For me, it's that you behave yourself in a correct way. Being loyal is one of the most important and most fundamental things. Welcome, dear listeners, to yet another English episode, as I'm very delighted to continue this English broadcast also, to reach out to all those desperate international listeners who just want to have a taste of what the Flights of Fancy is like. Well, right now I'm very pleased to welcome a very special guest, and if I may say so, a dear friend. Jacob, welcome. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> you have also said that you will say some, a little bit about yourself, who you are. Yeah, I'm just going to introduce myself real, real quick. My name is Jakob Farah. I'm 24 years old, and currently I'm a student of international relations in Groningen. Ah, so uh, that's the same as Kareem. So uh, the careful listeners will already and know what that's about. Coincidentally, also the same thing you were studying to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is completely accurate. But still, can you uh, reiterate very briefly what is international relations about? Why international relations it entails a lot of things. Uh, the bachelor is a very, very broad program. Program, but basically it is about the interaction between international entities, whether that are NGOs, states, IGOs, and yeah, like I said, it entails a lot of things and the interaction between international actors. I think that's a very nice and accurate description. You're a little bit of an international entity yourself too, I would say. <laughs> As an international student, one could say so. <laughs> and my first basic question to you as a person would be, generally, what do you like? What do I like? I like football. I like hanging out with friends. I like having good conversations. I like in people, if they have values, if I can rely upon them, if they're honest, that's probably the most important thing what is for me as a person. Then? Yeah, honesty is, um, I have a pretty simple concept of it, that you don't, not necessarily not lie to your friends. I wouldn't say that there aren't situations where you can lie to yeah. your friends to protect them or whatever, even if it's for their own good. But honesty means that somebody is upright with you and he doesn't try to backstab you. Okay, that he does, that he maybe promises something that was false, something like that. Yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be upright. If I would promise you something, if I would promise you to take you out to dinner tomorrow, even as a small example, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't do that, you wouldn't feel good. Because mm. I promised you something and then I didn't deliver. Yeah. And if you would imagine that kind of behavior in more severe situations than a dinner, mm. that has severe implications, I think. Yeah. I think it also shows that a person who would do that is a bit self-centered. Like he would view himself as more important than others and that anything justifies that. Yeah, I think not. a lot of people do that. Uh, otherwise, uh, a lot of behavior I think is hard to explain. Yeah, like what behavior? When one person decides to fuck over, for example, a friend, I mean, that happens every day in whatever businesses and yeah. politics and just small things when a friend takes a girlfriend of uh, his friend or mm. something, you know, yeah. that's something that doesn't really make sense in my worldview, mm. but still it happens. Yeah. Uh, and then I imagine that your dislikes, they would be the opposite of that. In people. Exactly. Yeah. Anything, any activities that you dislike? It's probably not the most fitting thing for a student to say, but I somewhat dislike sitting in a room all day, mm. having to read and to write. And yeah, because you like football also, you like to be active yeah, and outdoors. I'd rather and be outside uh, yeah. in general. Yeah, but I suppose you still have to do uh, a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> you have to do what you, what you, what you have to do. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Did that change? Like, because you said you have this feeling of like honesty and loyalty and to not be upright and to not backstab people. 
Has it always been the case for you that you have held these beliefs or did that develop also? <laughs> I've always had those beliefs, but they were more specific. I think when I was younger, they only entailed the people I cared for. And now it's broader. And now I try to apply it to everybody. At mm. least I try it. I know that I don't do it perfectly. Not nowhere near perfect, in fact. But I try to have the same standard also for people I don't know mm. in comparison to people I know. Mm. Yeah, you can imagine. All right, then we will approach the first interesting topic that you mentioned that you would like to talk about. And also what I personally think you have great insights to, because as you mentioned, you came here as an international student to study here, but where you grew up and where you lived uh, your whole life, actually, uh, other than in this town in Groningen is in Frankfurt. It's not entirely correct. I lived also in Bavaria for one and a half Oh years, yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. In a small village. Uh, yeah. When I say Frankfurt, what are the associations that pop into your mind? How would you describe My first association is that Frankfurt is my home. Yeah. And for that, I love it. I mean, everybody loves, loves their home with all the flaws that it has and with everything that it entails. But first of all, Frankfurt is my home. That's where my family is, where my mom is, where my friends are, where I grew up, you yeah. know? What where it, I think I developed mostly as a person. Yeah. So the meaning is yeah, uh, infinite. Exactly. But then that uh, already uh, points to an interesting point, namely, what are the flaws? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was clear that we were going to talk about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's actually an interesting thing because in general, I have to say that Frankfurt is a city that has a really unique character also within Germany. Yeah. Like one thing which makes it unique is the insane amount of local patriotism towards the city. Yeah. Everybody has has like a t-shirt with Frankfurt. You see sometimes grandmas, really I've seen that grandma with a t-shirt, Frankfurt, capital of crime, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, like the thing is, I was, I'm thinking, I was thinking about that a lot, why people feel that strongly about Frankfurt and I think one of the reasons is that Frankfurt is a rather extreme city in, mm. in everything. It has a lot of money, it has actually more jobs than people living there, which is insane for a city of 700,000 people. So there's a lot of people commuting from outside Frankfurt to uh, work there. Uh, yeah. Like during the day, I think Frankfurt has like 1.5 million people being there and like mm. I said, people who sleep there are around 700,000. It reminds me of an interesting story you told me once about how at one point there was a, like, I'm not sure what the German name was, but like a fascist demonstration in Frankfurt. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Pegida. Uh, Pegida, yeah. yeah. Do you remember where I want to go with yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. How they can try to come to Frankfurt. That was actually, that's one of the things that you can appreciate about Frankfurt. Uh, when Pegida tried to come so to in, Frankfurt. In brief, was, what, is, what is Pegida? Yeah, okay, try. Okay, Pegida is like a right-wing demonstration that started originally in Dresden. Mm. I think in Dresden. And it's somewhat of like, at least they see it as a spiritual successor of the Monday demonstration that happened during during the DDR, uh, during the Soviet Union in Eastern Germany. What's a Monday demonstration? It's like an old tradition that every Monday thousands and hundreds of thousands of people would demonstrate for a better life and stuff like that. Okay. That became like a tradition in Eastern Germany. Every Monday? Every Monday. Wow. And the Pegida demonstration, I think I held on Monday as well. That's like hmm. some people or the organizers view that as like a spiritual, spiritual successor, I guess. But they're also Nazis, right? Yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty much. I don't I don't know. It's it's hard. I think a lot of people are scared and it's, uh, it's a difficult thing to categorize. But generally, you can say it's a right wing thing. Hmm. A lot of people from what I've heard, just go there to drink or to socialize, <laughs> not because of the cause, ah, the political right. cause. Yeah. It's it's more like a society thing. However, they, they after a while, it became really, really famous because a lot of people went there and it started spreading to other cities. I think one of the first Western cities it went to was Cologne and actually it had quite a lot of people there, mm. which is surprising given like the amount of migrants that live in Cologne, you mm. would expect a stronger opposition. Yeah, or not, because a lot of migrants also attract a lot of right-wingers who hate migrants, I guess. Yeah, but still, like generally, if you have a lot of migrants, I have the feeling that people also get to know them and get to live with them. And yeah. then, yeah, okay. like, if your neighbor is Moroccan, you will see that not all Moroccans are bad. Yeah, no, it's because you will, you will have a normal relationship with your neighbor. Yeah, you know? yeah. 
but um, of course there's ex exemptions to the rule there's always like old people who don't like to mix with uh, foreign people as mm. they think then but uh, i mean we have that everywhere mm. but coming to back to the point that you were saying when pegida tried to come to frankfurt it was like maybe a few hundred people that actually participated in the demonstration uh, demonstration which was a really small amount and then you had a counter demonstration which consisted 5000 people or something mm. and, and pegida never came back to frankfurt yeah and also what i think was very telling because that's the reason why i remembered that story like the they sign? Had, yeah they had signs uh, they had, they had a sign <laughs> Go back to Germany, this is Frankfurt. <laughs> <laughs> Go I back to Germany, this is Frankfurt. That's you're referring to. Yeah. yeah, so it says something about Frankfurt. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be a nice introduction about Frankfurt, I think. And also, you mentioned the old lady wearing the T-shirt saying Frankfurt, capital of crime. So yeah. it is the case that uh, Frankfurt's very crime-ridden. That's at least uh, like the public perception. It used to be quite bad back in, back in the day, like in the 90s and stuff like that, when drugs did have a different role than they have nowadays. Yeah. They still play a big part, but it's not as overly influential as it was in, in the 90s, where yeah. you had like open-air drug markets and stuff like that. Oh, okay. He also, I think, mentions at one point this story about like gypsies living in this huge building they squatted in that you saw. I think they squatted in like in like a garden thing. It's like it's also like a German thing. We have in Germany, we don't have houses or in cities, you know, we just have apartments. But mm. German people, they want gardens. So what they do is they take a small part of a forest or something and divide it into little parcels of gardens, you know, mm. and then you can rent them and just go there and have mm. a little garden, you know. Mm. And sometimes those areas are deserted because there's not enough demand for gardens or something mm. like that. And that actually happened that a group of gypsies, like a big, <laughs> big family, moved or squatted like a whole garden area. And then actually a TV crew came there with like police and uh, they got evicted. Mm. Uh, yeah, quite crazy. Because also if I would go to Frankfurt right now, of course, the first thing they would see is the central station. And you mentioned also that the central station is quite an interesting place in a way. Mm. Uh, it's definitely an interesting place. I mean, if you want to see some interesting stuff, uh, go there at three o'clock in the night and stay there for an hour and you can you will see something interesting. What will you see? Yeah, all kinds of shit. You can never predict what, what's going to happen, but something will happen, definitely. Yeah, yeah, like what? Like, give me a, an example of something that could potentially... Yeah, I mean, the smallest thing that could happen is uh, like two junkies fighting or something. <laughs> you have pretty much a guarantee for that. How would that be like? Yeah, I don't know. A lot of screaming, a lot of spitting. <laughs> But also open air prostitution, right? Like yeah, in, in I mean, the, like the central station in itself is is like a, also a special neighborhood because you have still crack is sold openly there, heroin is sold openly there. Like you, if you just walk through there during the night, especially you would see people everywhere shooting up heroin, smoking crack. Mm. I think like street prostitution is one of the smallest issues. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's quite crazy. Anything you would like to share about that? Any experience? Anything you saw? I mean, to be honest, I didn't experience that. I mean, I lived around the corner for a while when I was like 18. I lived there for a couple of months and um, I saw a lot of small stuff, but I don't know, something that would be typical. I saw like Japanese tourists getting robbed by fake cops. <laughs> <laughs> How would that go? That's, uh, that's something that would happen on the regular. There was like a group of people next to the central station. They got like fake IDs from the police and they would always approach Japanese tourists pretending that they would be police and uh, uh, searching them. And then they would just take the cash. <laughs> was the <laughs> Japanese people seeing that happening also? Or would they do it like stealthily, sneakily? Nah, they just, I mean, they just take their belongings, their wallet, their passport and whatever and go wow. through it, take the money and give it back to them. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they don't even realize it. Sometimes they would realize it. But how would you react if you're yeah. in a foreign country? Yeah. Police, as you would think, police approaches you and takes your belongings. Mm. What are you supposed to do? Yeah, Call crazy. the police? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. mean, you're just getting robbed by police. You don't know. So <laughs> like, yeah. there are countries where I can definitely imagine you would get robbed by police. Yeah, definitely. obviously not Germany. No, Africa. People, yeah. people don't know it, maybe. And um, there's also the quite interesting financial district in Frankfurt because Frankfurt is also like very much the financial capital of Europe, right? I think London is still the financial yeah. capital. Well, at least like European Union. Yeah, the European Central Bank is in Frankfurt, and uh, 
on the continent, it's definitely the biggest financial center. Yeah. yeah. What does it look like? We have a lot of skyscrapers. Uh, Frankfurt actually looks more like an American city, I would say, than European city. Uh, oh. For like for its size, we have a lot of skyscrapers, and we used to have the biggest skyline of Europe uh, mm. until Moscow and uh, London caught up. Mm. But uh, looks quite fancy, to be honest. Well, you mentioned there's like interesting differences happening there. Like <laughs> Are you mean between night and day? Yeah. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, some of the Big banks are located right next to the central station, uh, which puts them into proximity of the whole junkie and prostitution thing, you know? Ah, so it's mostly it's obvious, the central station thing. Yeah, I mean, the central station is like the vibrating center of a city, you mm. know, always. That's where people arrive, you know, that's, that's where people depart from. Uh, mm. That's where a lot of business is conducted, legal and illegal, you know? Mm. Central Station is always center of uh, of the city, yeah. but um, I think what you're referring to is that during the day you have bankers using the banks, obviously, yeah. as you can imagine, and during the night it's quite a funny image. You have to imagine fanciest skyscraper, you know, with big lights and everything, yeah. and in the entrance you see like ten junkies <laughs> shooting up heroin, really, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, like you have lived. Um, a long time in Frankfurt. How long was it? Yeah, I was born in Frankfurt, born and raised, as you say. So, yeah. now um, I was born in 1993, first of January, actually 1993, yeah. and I've lived there basically till 2012, with yeah. the exemption of one and a half years where I went to a border school in yeah. uh, Bavaria. Yeah. Because I, I asked that because if you lived there for such a long time, you could also see changes occurring within the city itself. For example, in regards to gentrification. Mm. I mean, gentrification is a really big topic at the moment, in, uh, not only in Frankfurt, also in, uh, in Germany. Uh, yeah. Gentrification is the concept that, um, as you can imagine, real estate is always um, dictated or the value of real estate is always dictated by its location. Uh, and uh, traditionally, you have a lot of inner city neighborhoods which are rather poor because they're close to the business and they used to be loud and mm. everything. Uh, and it was rather seen as the good thing to live outside in a nice home, mm. you know. But what changed over the years is that people want good infrastructure. They want to have a home that's close to the subway. They want to have a supermarket across the street. They want to have uh, the convenience of a good location. Mm. And... A lot of times, uh, the neighborhoods that provided such uh, an infrastructure and such a location were rather poor neighborhoods mm. in, in German cities, especially. And um, what happened then is that around 10 years ago, simultaneously, projects all over Germany were initiated in inner cities to kind of change the layouts of the cities mm. to make the inner circles the richer the richer neighborhoods and the outer the suburbs than the poor neighborhoods mm. it's basically they try to design it that's what we always said like uh, paris for mm. example or like mm. french, french yeah, cities where, the, where you have the wealthy wealthy inner city yeah. and then the poor suburbs yeah and uh, what effect does that have on the people living there that development yeah i mean gentrification is uh, yeah generally you have to, you have to imagine they target a neighborhood because of its prime location mm. and they try to change the character or it's it's also hard to say they i mean the city planners because obviously they want uh, they're working together with investors and they already have plans for what's going to happen in that neighborhood and then they initiate certain projects like they get certain businesses into uh, into the neighborhood, like hipster businesses yeah. or for whatever. Yeah, but just like something that, that attracts students or yeah. something like that, you know? Like that South Park episode. <laughs> I mean, the South Park episode was exactly about that, you know, yeah. about gentrification. Uh, for example, when I was a kid, Bornheim is the, the neighborhood where I grew up in, in Frankfurt. And it's really, really central. You have to imagine it used to border the inner city like we have an inner city district and Bornham used to go all the way towards the inner city and um, what they then did is they changed the layout of the city they introduced a certain rent yeah. level yeah. Uh, minimum uh, rent minimum rent for certain for certain neighborhoods and it has four different levels yeah. and it basically changed the complete structure of a few neighborhoods and they even uh, additionally did some tricks because um yeah if i may interrupt yeah. they basically in a way it's really like unfair or something i imagine because 
in most places and countries there are like really strict laws on how much you can exploit people with rent but in this case it's actually the government saying even though right now you live in a really shitty apartment as a minimum you have to pay an insane amount of rent so they basically force all the poor people to move out right? yeah it's um yeah it's not that simple they don't obviously they can't just say okay you get the same apartment you did before yeah and we just gonna raise the rent by 100 percent, and you're gonna yeah. have to pay it the renters always have to do something they have to do a certain improvements hmm. to the to the apartment but what they could do, for example, is uh, a core renovation of a apartment, mm. which would take like a year or something, mm. you know, makes it almost livable or inhabitable. Uh, and they can just do that with the people staying there. And then most people will just move out you yeah, know, because okay. they can't stand, uh, stay there for a year. Yeah. And uh, that's just a small example. Or they don't even the higher you rent, but they stop, uh, they stop fixing your, your stuff, for example. Yeah. They basically try to mop you out. A friend of mine, is, he has a really, really interesting location in the city. He lives right next to the dome. Yeah. The and dome? The dome in Frankfurt, that's also right in the inner city. Oh, the tower. The, or... the, the big church. Yeah. Yeah. And what's interesting about that, or the houses right next to the dome used to be quite low income, even though they had the most prime location you could imagine. Yeah. They're between the dome and the river in Frankfurt. You yeah. know, it doesn't get any more prime location than that. But what happened to the friend, or actually I know three people living there. It's just a couple of blocks, you know, next uh, next to the dome. And I know a lot of people living there. <laughs> actually, a two Egyptian guy with the same name also living in the same street. Huh. It's also quite funny. But anyway, what happened to one of the guys was they just stopped fixing the shit, you know, mm. from, from the apartment. The apartment basically falls apart. And what they told him was, yeah, we're going to fix it once you guys are gone. Wow. You know? Because it's clear that they're not going to stay there for too long. And they just try to not start the renovation while they're there. But if uh, the family of uh, my friend doesn't move away in time, I think they will just start the renovation and basically yeah. force them out. Yeah. yeah. then more to a different topic namely actual uh, kind of street culture or like underworld culture that you know something of because a lot of people close to you actually got involved in that culture i think a good starting question to approach that subject would be that you have been kind of influenced by the vibe or something in that namely that if you would go back to frankfurt right now uh, and stay there for a month then you mention well, that would kind of has an effect on you, like when you see someone walking to you across the street, you know? Yeah, I mean, your surrounding always has an influence uh, on on you. And I have to say, like the both examples for me, Groning and Frankfurt are quite, quite two extremes, you know? Because Groning, to me, is almost like student's paradise, you know? Yeah. And the overall mentality is really, really relaxed and people are really friendly. And that is definitely different in Frankfurt. I mean... German people are less friendly, I would say, than Dutch people in general. Mm. But um, overall, Frankfurt has a really aggressive vibe. Like, if you... The thing, what I told you with... Um, when guys look at you in the wrong way or something like that. I mean, I'm not going to get into a fight because somebody looks at me in the wrong way. But it, there's a thing in Frankfurt we call a blick fick. <laughs> <laughs> it means, oh, like, uh, fuck, fuck you with the eye or something, yeah. you know? And... It's basically a thing where two guys, when they see each other, they look at they look at one, and when their eyes meet, uh, they look at each other, and it becomes into somewhat of a dick comparison. Then who looks away first? You know, uh. if neither of them looks away, there's the possibility that uh, this escalates into a fight. And uh. This happens really on a regular. Wow. Which would you imagine is quite stupid? Like really, yeah. you can look at somebody and 
within a matter of two or three seconds, a fight could uh, erupt, you know? Yeah. And I mean, if you're surrounded by that kind of energy, obviously you react differently to that, you know, in the beginning, then you, you think, ah, it doesn't matter, you know, on groaning level, so to say, if yeah. somebody looks at me, who gives a fuck, you know, yeah. but <laughs> after two weeks again, then you think, why is this little fucker looking at me like that? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> what do you think he is? <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I uh, also said something about a certain parallel Gesellschaft existing in Frankfurt. Yeah, I mean, you have that everywhere. You have that even in groaning. What is that? Yeah, parallel society is just, I mean, it's it's really like a cliche word as well. But the thing overall, I would say that there's parts of society or people, groups, circle of friends, whatever you want to call it, you know, that don't necessarily agree with the, the values that the mainstream society imposes and kind of come up with a system of their own values and own rules and stuff like that. What's and the difference? There's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different, I guess, groups which have different standards than the mainstream society. But I think the group you would refer to is then uh, the street, <laughs> yeah. as you would, uh, as you would call it. And also there's a lot of differences, but in general, you have different mentality. Like there's, yeah, I think uh, if I may interrupt, there's uh, also this, I think it like the mentality is kind of shown in this blick pick story uh, that it's a bit more yeah, maybe it's like a well, marginalizing words or something, but like more primal, you know, like more na natural, like the baboons, you know, just fighting over these really basic things or something like the manly respect and the territory and you know yeah, like... i think i think it's not only that i mean there's uh, like i said there's a lot of uh, a lot of layers to that and for me there's also differences there's like youth subculture you know in germany we have that Aussie culture i don't know that german rap culture people who also don't agree with what the state stands for or at least they say they don't uh, but for me then there's also a different part which is then the street and also like the criminal criminal uh, yeah. underworld because uh, that's where i think the real real differences uh, yeah. occur and that's not only with like primal behavior or something like that but that's just they having completely different values yeah because you also uh, which which are respected uh, throughout society yeah. you know like for example um, yeah, it's the easiest example that like dealing weed is not acceptable by society mm -hmm. that's like the smallest <laughs> the smallest evil you can pick mm -hmm. in the like criminal underworld yeah and I don't know. There's a complete difference in mentality. Yeah, in those circles point. also. You mentioned that in those circles there are different standards how you would choose friends compared to as a student in Groningen. Like in, in there, you would have a saying: "Der Junge ist stabil." Uh, what does that mean? Uh, der Junge stabil is a concept which is somewhat hard to translate. Uh, well, I would say the guy is stable. Yes, but stable is not used in that way. You know, mm. stabil is slang. Obviously, yeah, stable okay. stable means uh, stabil, but uh, stabil means it's like a mixture. I tried to explain to you earlier, like a mixture between stand-up guy, tough guy, I don't know, badass maybe. A lot of badass sounds so American. Yeah, maybe like what, the, what does that mean, badass? Yeah, okay, badass is maybe tough. the wrong word. Tough, uh, tough, tough and stand-up guy maybe that you don't take shit, that you represent what you say and um, that you're like a loyal guy, honest and loyal guy. That's that's basically what categorizes you as uh, stabil then. Mm. Uh, what does that mean? Like, as in, what does uh, it say about the Frankfurt's underworld culture? Yeah, then? I mean, what you were saying earlier is that, for example, in Groning, you choose friends according to i mean it's it's the same as well in frankfurt like uh, how do you connect to people but um in frankfurt in those kind of like milieus there's also different motivations for some people to choose friends or to choose people that they hang with you mm -hmm. know for example if you have a small guy dealing weed you know mm -hmm. he will look for a big friend that always hangs with him you like know literally big literally big yeah. for just big guy that can that can protect him you know mm -hmm. And you will see that so often, man. You will see that so often that like a small weed dealer has like a really big guy and he hangs out with him and they somewhat have of like a, bio a symbiosis, you know, mm. yeah, like a nature. 
I mean, the the small guy then somewhat feeds the big guy, you know. Oh. I mean, prob I, was, I would I like things. He pays for the food. He gives him weed, probably stuff like oh, that, wow. you know. So there's definitely benefits for the big guy as well. Yeah. And um, like those guys probably do have some kind of relationship or history together, yeah. you know. But in, for example, then in a situation like Ronin where the small guy wouldn't feel the need for protection, they wouldn't necessarily hang all day, every day. Yeah, you know? okay, and there they would. Yeah, and there they would. Ah, interesting, interesting. And you uh, also mentioned that when, even though you're, you wouldn't necessarily be, when you dress a certain way, when you look a certain way, when you walk a certain way in Frankfurt, or you come into certain neighborhoods, it's not at all the case that problems just arise because of, those that underworld itself but it's also the interaction between them and the police and that in a lot of circumstances the police also doesn't act fairly would you agree yeah of course i mean i've told you also a lot of stories you have but... one you have one example of like at supermarket <laughs> it's a really stupid story man really really stupid okay so um I was staying over at a friend's place. I think we were working on his PC or some shit like that. And we didn't sleep. It was like eight o'clock in the morning. I went back home. It was raining, raining like shit as well. And I came across supermarket and they have like a small roof outside where there's a small stone edge where you can sit, you know. It was raining like shit. I was wearing, I don't know, some pants, but they were completely wet. So I decided to stay there for like a minute or something until the rain would uh, cool down. And I saw a guy walking into the supermarket. I knew him from seeing. I also knew his name, but uh, just it was just a guy I knew from seeing, you know. And we shook hands. He walked into the store. <laughs> then I actually saw how he just went to the uh, to the fridge, grabbed two, I don't know, two beverages, you know, went out the store and said like, bye, bye to the cashier, you know, just while walking, uh, <laughs> without uh, walking out, obviously without paying. And uh, he ran away. I didn't care about it, you know. Why should I care if somebody steals from the supermarket? I didn't do nothing. I just sat there and uh, the guy ran away and then the cashier came out as well. And then she looked at me and said, yeah, you shook hands, you know him. She grabbed me by the arm, you know. And I was a bit irritated by that, to say the least, you know. I told her basically to fuck off. She didn't do that. And uh, I just freed my arm, just like, I don't know, moved my arm so she would lose, lose the grip. Turned around and I was snatched again by, her, by a police guy this, uh, this time, you know. Mm. I mean, for him, the situation looked really obvious. A cashier was holding me, I was uh, freeing myself, and uh, he did probably what was right in that situation, to grab me first, to mm. see what's going on. Uh, so they took me to the to the station and afterwards demanded my, my ID and everything. And in the beginning, I didn't even want to give them my ID because I literally did nothing. Mm. I sat outside the store, <laughs> then the cashier fucking grabbed me, I freed myself, and I was arrested for that, you know? Mm. Seems pretty stupid. And... So I wouldn't give them my ID. Then they surrounded me and said, yeah, either you give us the ID or we take it. Then I gave them the ID. And it was it was not a nice experience, I have to say. I was pretty young still as well, like 16 or something. And they wanted to have the name of the guy who stole the, the Cokes or the beverages, you know? That is something you don't do, though, obviously. Like, you would, or at least I would think of myself, I've never been in, like, extreme situations where it was really really extreme and my life depended on whether i would make a statement or not you know to come out of responsibility but i would think that i wouldn't uh, talk to police about other people crimes it also know? says something about that street culture right <laughs> like the values yeah it's just like yeah it's just like a thing that you that you are taught from when you were young that's basically one of the first thing when i first met like a guy who uh, <laughs> introduced me into some kind of business <laughs> he uh, like over the top explained me yeah if you talk to police and blah 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 and he just tried to scare me because he didn't know me you know i was uh, you also have to imagine when i got involved in that shit i was like 14 or something i had mm. long blonde hair <laughs> long blonde curls you know i didn't look like the typical uh, street kid you know mm. and um yeah, i think he, he was just scared that uh, i would run to police first time i would get into trouble or something that's mm. why i tried to scare me a bit <laughs> but i uh, back to back to the story at the supermarket 
then they kept me at the after they arrested me they kept me at the police station for i don't know how long like the entire day and they wouldn't let me call my mom nothing they just uh, took everything away from me at some point because i didn't talk the entire time at some point they called my mom she came over they told her like i assaulted a supermarket cashier that's what they just straight up told her on the phone you know that i physically assaulted uh, yeah the, the supermarket physically cashier. assaulted yeah and obviously she didn't believe it because she knows me and she knew me also back then and i would i wouldn't uh, hit a girl or a woman you know mm. i wouldn't do that and so she came there and she was she was also fully supportive and she insisted okay i have to, I have to give some legal background now if you're arrested in germany under 18 first thing the police have to do is notify your parents mm. second thing is you can't be interviewed without the presence of your parents mm. I was kept there for like at least eight hours without my mom being notified or with her being present. That was uh, was completely not uh, not the case. Mm. When she arrived, she was obviously a bit pissed because she knew it and it was also not the first time that we had contact with police and it was also not the first time that the police uh, behaved themselves in a really incorrect way, you know? Yeah. And um, that's why she, I guess, was also that supportive because a similar story happened to me also like a year earlier where Russell was arrested for no reason. Mm. And at that point, she insisted that she would be present in the interview. Mm. And I remember the policewoman just literally said, if you insist on being present, we have to cancel the interview at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but legally, she can't even start it. You know, yeah. it's so, so stupid. And yeah, we uh, afterwards we uh, sued uh, the police guys and stuff like that, but nothing, nothing came out of that. Mm. And I got charged with, like I said, I don't know how many things, like theft, assault, and some other things as well. Even though I didn't even enter the supermarket, mm. <laughs> it's completely, completely stupid. But yeah. I mean, that's what you get. And like the thing is, having a physical assault charge uh, is not nice thing mm -hmm. like i didn't get obviously i didn't it didn't go before court you know because it had no substance whatsoever you know so mm -hmm. i wasn't i wasn't judged with with anything uh, or wasn't punished with anything but still state services police and some other people like security uh, businesses or something they can view into that kind of uh, file from me and they can see like all the charges i got mm -hmm. which is completely uh, stupid you know yeah, exactly i want to ask you a more like, I don't know, abstract question or like a more emotional or sensitive question because so far you have told me many details about like what it's like to live in that environment. But these are all very concrete things, like very mm -hmm. concrete situations and concrete circumstances. And you yourself, when I say that, you can put it into perspective because you know the general like vibe or emotion or atmosphere, you know, of what it's like to be in that place in that time. But an outsider doesn't know that. So yeah, like this like general feeling or something, like how people interact with each other. Like, uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. The thing is, it's kind of difficult for me also to reflect on those things because you have to imagine when I was younger, when I was involved in all that, I didn't reflect on my actions. Yeah. You know, I had a completely different pattern of thinking uh, than, uh, than I developed here in Groningen. And uh, so you just do a lot of stuff yeah. without, without really thinking. But um, obviously there are underlying reasons for that, you know, and sometimes if you think back, you can somewhat try to decipher certain situations and then say, okay, this probably motivated me to do something mm. like that. And like the general thing is, um, I don't know exactly what it was that uh, got me into that like illegal thing you know the thing is to be honest i've always felt attracted to something like that you know when i was a kid like five years old i would sometimes steal something from the supermarket or something mm. just unnecessarily but i think it it starts like that that if you're really young you do things like that and then you get more into more and you get into bigger stuff and you get used to it you know yeah but now the answer that you give me and i don't want to push you in a certain direction or give my own meaning to it and stop me if yeah. i do but what you say now what you answer to me now is like an answer to why do i things did i do the things that i do why did i was I in certain moments where actually what I wanted to go to is more like the, the underlying the reasons? No, 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 well, not not something you psychologically, but like the environment that you're in, you know, the things which were not under your control, the 
the people you are surrounded by, like the culture you are in, like okay. the, the vibe of the streets, you know, because I do have the feeling that this is like such a separate world on its own, which so many people don't know anything about and the media portrays mm. in such a biased way or something. Yeah, I can, or, or would you, I could try to, to give some stories that, I mean, it's always hard to just come up with, uh, with stories, you know, like I told you earlier, usually my memory gets triggered by yeah. something and then I have some kind of memory to that. But like the overall mentality, this what I also cut on earlier, is uh, different than in mainstream society, obviously. Yeah. And it starts with small things. Like one example is, I also have to say that I was always growing up, I was always like caught in between two worlds, you know? Which I was... Yeah, between like the, the, the world which we are now, like the groaning student world, you know, the, being at a gymnasium, at a gymnasium, being at a good school, you know, but also living in a rather sketchy neighborhood and uh, having friends <laughs> that have nothing to do with uh, the guys that you hang out with mm. uh, at school, you know. But so for me, it's, it's always a bit uh, difficult as well. But in general, the mentality is, it's hard to describe. Let me, let me start with, uh, with something small. I was, like I said, in the in the school where rather rich kids went in general. Mm. There were a few exemptions, but uh, the overall level of uh, financial status was rather high in, in the school. Mm. And the kids had a different mentality to what I was used to from uh, from home. For example, if a kid in the school would have a chocolate and he would eat it in front of you, he would look at you and he wouldn't offer you anything, you know. Mm. And then you would then you would ask him can have a piece of chocolate, you know, and then he would give you literally one piece of chocolate, you know, and um, this was the gymnasium. This was the gymnasium with the, with the rich kids. And then you would be at, uh, I don't know, not even necessarily with your like close friends, but just in a youth center, you know, with uh, people that you have something in common, namely that you spend time together at the same youth center, not even that close of a relationship as if you would be in the same class or something, you know. I remember one incident where somebody, it happened on the same day, it also happened in the school, you know, like somebody was eating chocolate in the school and then somebody was eating chocolate later in the youth center. And the guy who was eating a chocolate in the youth center was like a small Italian guy, like two two years younger than me, I think. He was looking at me and said, hey, do you want chocolate? Hmm. I said, yes. And he gave me like half of, hmm. of his chocolate uh, thing, you know. Nice. And uh, that's like one small difference yeah. in, in mentality that's uh, yeah. that's so like maybe, one of the po positive aspects yeah so maybe so. that in the upper civilized society it's more everyone for himself yeah it's more individual definitely yeah. like the the street or poorer parts of society are definitely more traditional communal Not, yeah communal as well but Community. also tradition traditional wow. uh, communal it depends on the city you know mm. i wouldn't say frankfurt is very mm. communal okay but I know some other big cities with, uh, which have strong communities and stuff like but that. But what that, then do you mean with traditional? Traditional in the sense of uh, just like human human interaction. Mm. Uh, I also suppose gender roles. like gen uh, Yeah, yeah like, gender roles as well. Yeah, of like course. girls yeah. have to be incredibly feminine and vulnerable and so yeah, yeah, not, and not necessarily or... Nah, not necessarily vulnerable. That has also changed. You have like a lot of loud girls and yeah, stuff okay. like that. Yeah. But, but submissive, uh, I guess, or not? Nah, no, not necessarily. That also changes over the yeah, years okay. because it's still it's still Germany, yeah. you know. <laughs> but overall, you have at least from what I experienced in Frankfurt, you have more traditional values, and I mean with that everything, like the smallest basic human interaction with like the chocolate, then yeah, I don't know what you what you look into for people by what standards you you judge them you know mm. as we were saying earlier things like uh, loyalty honor respect something mm. like that i mean honor is like a concept that is completely abandoned in modern society you know you yeah. get left at for that if you say i have my honor you know then yeah. say you're pride you fool or whatever yeah. you know why you take your honor and uh, honor what for a lot it? of people is still a positive concept you yeah know? what is it honor <laughs> For me, it's that you behave yourself in a correct way, you know, but also that you don't take unnecessary shit, you know. Yeah, but for you, honor has nothing to do with law, right? What is legal and illegal? No. Or, well, I, no, I it's, uh, Honor is, is not a legal thing, it's a moral thing. Yeah. It has nothing to do with morality. If the state, for example, unjustifiedly uh, imprisons your brother, 
you mm -hmm. know, and you know that mm -hmm. for a fact, would you consider it an honorable to free your brother? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Yeah. You know, I think it would be an honorable, honorable thing to do uh, mm -hmm. because you take into account or you're, you're willing to accept a lot of consequences in order to achieve something that you think is right mm -hmm. and which should be right in, in that instance as well. Mm -hmm. What about loyalty? How is that in quote unquote civilized society? I think loyalty should be still a big concept because you can't really say anything negative about loyalty. Yeah. How could you? Man, lo being loyal is one of the most important and most uh, fundamental things. Well, a bit critical. Nazis were loyal too, right? Yeah, but not their loyalty was their problem, but that they were loyal to the wrong thing. You yeah. know, if oh, they if they were loyal to the wrong thing, then uh, that's something loyal. else. Yeah, but loyal loyalty in general is something is something good. You know, it can be misused, but that's not then the problem of loyalty, but the pro problem of the actor that misuses it. You mm. know, you can always mis misuse positive things. Mm. That doesn't mean that the things become negative. Mm. That's a very good conclusion, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, listen to, listening all the way through. Oh, wait, no. One final question. I always like to um, ask the guest like a certain advice that a listener can learn from. So maybe like you can give an advice. Like if you find yourself, I don't know, like in a uh, neighborhood, which is like a bit... <laughs> I don't know, or like maybe how to deal with police or like... You really think you know, some of the listeners are looking for advice how to deal with problems in the hood? <laughs> no, just like any kind of advice that you can give, which is like, which something that people don't know about. I don't know. The, the one advice I would give to people if you find yourself in situations where you don't know how to behave yourself, just be uh, upright, be yourself and stand for what you believe in. That's always the best thing you can do. Yeah. That was very nice. Well, I thank you uh, very much for uh, listening all the way through the second glorious English episode. Please do not forget to uh, get me that desperately needed like and subscribe and comment because I crave it. I'm already scratching my arm because I haven't had a like in three days. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. And now it's time for the outro.